Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this evening's web talk at the Manchester and North West Irish branch. My name is Ashley. I'm the, the secretary this evening, uh, helped by the very able Jennifer E um, in the background doing questions. Helen, future Molly, helping us out from Irish, and uh, Bob Briscoe uh, down in uh, in Cheshire, who's very kindly organised. Um, an old colleague of his, Tracy Carter from Cheshire Fire Rescue Service. And Tracy's here to do. Uh, a fantastic talk on business fire safety and how things happen in Cheshire. Um, just to remind you all, yeah, there's a, a mute thing that's going on, so we're using the chat for questions, and Jen will feel those in the background. This meeting is being recorded, um, so this can be, be then added to um, added to the uh, the website for release and review at a later date. And um, I can quietly. Uh, why I'm neck in now and uh, hand over to Tracy, who's uh, down in uh, Cheshire. Hello, Tracy. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. Um, as uh, just been mentioned, I'm Tracy Carter, Business Safety Manager from Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and I'm going to go through a little bit about what I do, what the team does, and what our objectives are um, at Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service. So um, if everyone's happy with me to continue, I'll share my screen and we can start the presentation. Okay, uh, is everybody seeing the presentation okay? Okay, great. So um, basically um, today I, I want to talk a little bit about how we do things in Cheshire. Um, we are a little bit different to uh, other fire authorities. Um, although um, we all come under the, the umbrella of a fire service, uh, everybody, each authority works slightly different. Um, so I think uh, this is obviously Cheshire's way. That's not to say that's how Manchester works. So it, just bear that in mind when obviously I'm going through the, through the presentation. So um, the first slide is obviously to meet the business safety team. You may recognise somebody on there as well as myself, uh, which is obviously Bob, which is our business safety volunteer. And then we have two business safety advocates um, as well that support me in uh, delivering the service out to the businesses. So the typical role for a business safety advocate is they are going out and meeting the business owners and they will actually carry out the visits. Whereas my role is obviously to manage the advocates, but I do a lot of networking and um, sort of making a lot of partnership working, working with businesses and going out to business chambers and sort of making those initial contacts with businesses. So I sort of take more of a strategic role uh, and make those partnerships, whereas the advocates actually go out and, and carry out the visits. So um, I thought would be a good question um, is, is Again, don't know whether you're on mute or not. I just wanted a little bit of interaction. What is it that you know about us? Are you aware that Cheshire deliver fire safety a little bit different and that we do actually have a business safety team? Um, I don't know whether you've got the facility for people to, to sort of give me some guidance on what you know about us. Well, from um, from our experience up in, the, up in Lancashire, I know Lancashire's um, doing all sorts of interesting stuff around fire safety. I also know that Cheshire from... Um, your really good reputation there, Tracy, um, for driving a different approach to fire safety in the area. So, yeah, I think there's a there's a there's some commonality, but I think there's some significant differences. Yes, um, I, I think you're right there. Um, I think what's great about uh, Cheshire is they very much want us to engage with businesses, um, and we have a dedicated business safety team, which a lot of other fire authorities don't have. They have enforcement teams that go out doing inspections, but they don't actually just have a team that go out and do engagement. So we, we actually primarily go out to visitors, uh, vis go out to businesses. We, um, we have a look at what they've already got in place, but we also advise them what they should have in place um, if they need to make some amendments, if they have an audit. The problem you've got with um, the legal side of things with regards when it's an inspection, which is what the other fire authorities generally deliver, it is a legal pathway, a bit like when Ofsted turns up at school, it's a legal pathway and what you see while you're there, you have to report on. Whereas what we do is we are engaging, so we will go out to businesses and we will, you know, 
prepare them for when their audit takes place. So there's no excuses when they arrive with an inspection to say we didn't know because we've already pre-warned them what is expected. So that's a little bit different. Um, Cheshire do invest in having this business safety team and, and we, we get around an awful lot of businesses around 2,500 businesses a year, we will sort of carry out a visit. And we tend to go to the, the businesses that are smaller, uh, sort of not the big corporate ones. We'll go to the smaller ones that sometimes get forgotten. So that's a little bit different about us, whereas inspections tend to be more on the bigger businesses, probably got more employees. Um, we will go to the ones that what we call a small business owned, probably got 10 employees or less. Um, and tend to be run by independent business owners. That's that's who we concentrate on. Okay, so um, what we have is, um, again, I don't know whether you, uh, some of you don't are aware that there is a legal obligation for a fire service to obviously carry out our legal visits and that comes under protection. So there's sort of protection, which is the legal route, which is all business related. And there's also prevention, which is around domestic homes. And the two are very, very different. Protection, which is obviously under where business safety sits, is uh, about obviously covered and managed by the fire safety order and that tells us what we need to do when we're going out and that's where all, all businesses will find their information from. The fire safety order 2005 was brought in to try and make it easier for businesses to meet fire safety legislation. So um, under that umbrella we have business safety and we do a mixture of engagement and enforcement. So we start off with our visits and they're very much about engagement, talking to businesses. However, legally, if we do find a business that is very much not meeting legislation and, you know, is putting people's lives at risk, then we would pass that on for an immediate audit. So we're, we're sort of, um, as I say, business safety team is the good cop, the inspectors are the bad cop. So it's really nice to be on the good cop team because uh, we're going out and we're sort of engaging and making people aware. OK, so under those um, arrows, basically we run free workshops and seminars inviting businesses to come in. We choose topics that we generally find businesses tend to have a little bit of a grey area, not quite sure whether they're meeting it or not. So we'll choose topics. It, it might be uh, about um fire exits it might be about how how long people um emergency routes escape routes we'll sort of choose topics that we commonly get questions over um and obviously then and these are generally picked up through in informal visits then enforcement is obviously the inspection which you've just talked about which is a very much illegal when they arrive you have to let them in and they will carry out an inspection. What they find on the day, you'll get a report and that could end up in an enforcement if you're not meeting legislation, which I'm sure most of you are all aware of. OK, so on the prevention side, this does get uh, we, we it's a common thing that people think we have some legal um, power of people's homes. However, we don't. There is no legal powers for a fire service to make anybody have anything in their homes. So it's quite difficult if um, people are visiting homes because we can guide and we can advise, but we can't enforce. So protection um, has the power. Prevention is just advice. And that is very much around domestic homes. OK. So that's just a little bit around, but around the split. So we talked on about the engagement and enforcement. We're all about the engagement. We are the, the team, we, we are the friendly team that will go out and obviously um, you can ask us questions. We go out with a pack that's got all, all the different things that are required during your audit. So we actually call them pre-audit visits so that um, you've got a one-to-one -one person to ask about, would this be okay? Would that be okay? Where would we find this information from? And we very much signpost our visits to the website. I don't know whether anybody has been on our website, but uh, we do pride ourselves with the amount of information that is on there. What we want is businesses to be able to self-serve, go onto our website and download the free templates, uh, the free information that's on there, and actually self uh, self-serve on all the information that's available um, you know I do pride ourselves on the, the wealth of information that's on there um, because certainly during Covid we've 
we've obviously found it very difficult to engage because we've not been able to go out to businesses. So we've done an awful lot of social media and updates on the website so that businesses are still able to contact that information. Okay, so if people say to us, why, you know, why do we bother? It's a business responsibility. The ownership is on the business to get the enforcement right. So why is it that we're carrying out those visits when we don't have to? We haven't got a legal duty to do visits, only to do inspections. As I touched on, uh, Cheshire say, if we engage and we build those relationships with those businesses, they're more likely to come to us and ask questions. They're more likely to come and build that relationship with us. And they'll come to our business seminars for free advice. They'll come and ask those questions that they're not sure about. So we really are about building that relationship with all those small business communities. Um, and we do this through a number of, of ways, which we'll touch on later. So we're asking why there's um, obviously the fire safety enforcement. Well, obviously it, it's it's a, a legal requirement under the under the order, um, and obviously it, it is known typically known as a non-domestic premises, um, which again is is obviously uh, a business. Uh, non-domestic. A few people say, "Where's that phrase come from?" It's a reporting side that all fire authorities use that terminology. Um, non-domestic. Okay, we've got around thirty-eight thousand businesses in Cheshire, which is an awful lot of businesses. So myself and obviously the small team that you saw at the front. Um, you know, it's it's quite a big ask. We're not going to get around all of those in one year. Um, but we are ticking them off and we are engaging. And as I say, we do that through visits, but we also do a lot now through social media. Um, we've done Q&A sessions like we're having tonight. Um, and I also, you know, work with business chambers uh, and other networking groups to do presentations like we've got tonight on key subjects that people might ask for me to deliver on or just a general understanding on how we are different to the inspectors. Um, it is based on uh, risk base. So basically the, the government asks us to um, deliver our visits and our inspections around risk. So predominantly inspections will be done um, on, on what we call our, our priority. So that would be sleeping risk. So you're talking hotels, uh, care homes, hospitals, anything that, um, and supported living, anything that has a sleep uh, sleeping element that is classed as a risk anywhere that has a large amount of vulnerable people so again your care homes hospitals etc or it could be your coma sites where there's more risk due to chemicals etc so all of those are put on a priority priority list and all of those types of uh, premises that I've just uh, discussed will get a more uh, regular visit due to the risk uh, and that's what we call our risk-based inspection program and that's driven by central government on how we go out and deliver these audits. Many people will say to me would well, you know I've, I've been in business five years and we've never had a we've never had a visit from you and they almost tell me like they've got away with it uh, they almost talk to me as if to say you know we're waiting for you to arrive and um, we've not had one and I always say to them well it doesn't mean that you've got away with it for five years because what the responsibility is, is that you're happy because it's the business owner's responsibility that they're happy to carry on their business and that they're meeting fire safety legislation. They almost feel because we've not been an audited them that they're getting away with it. So I always try to say to people, you're not getting away with it. You are only getting away with it when you're confident that you've got everything in place. We will get to you at some point, it might be next year, it could be in three years time, but you need to be ready for when you get that inspection. And that's the type of sense I want to leave them with, not to be frightened to come and ask us questions, but to be ready for that inspection. Okay, as I've just said, they are random and some are targeted. The random ones tend to be complaints. Um, you know, we do actually get quite a lot of people that do contact us, they do email us, they do ring us, they go to restaurants, they make visits um, and they're not happy. Um, a fire alarm could go off and it's organised chaos and they contact us and say, I was in this situation and I did not feel comfortable. Or they'll go and visit somewhere, they'll go and stop at a B&B 
and they'll say there was nothing on the doors about what to do in the event of a fire, really felt uncomfortable. We actually respond to those uh, within 48 hours, um, mostly the next day. Um, we will go out and we'll say that we've received a complaint. So we, we do act on those. We have a legal duty to act on those straight away. So they're what we call random. And then the targeted inspections are the ones that are following a risk-based inspection programme. OK, um, there's obviously um, the, the national audit that fire authorities all have to follow this risk based inspection programme. So there are areas that we have to do so, and we can do com some comparisons. So we will do comparisons around the hospitals and the care homes to see if there's any common themes to see whether centrally as a fire service, we need to make change. This might be typically bringing in Grenfell uh, into our conversations, obviously, with what happened there, that is going to change how everybody delivers for our safety, because that is something that impacts on everyone. So following that, obviously, the instruction came out that, you know, within high rise, different responsibilities had to take place regarding the cladding. And that was an instant you need to uh, all follow the same process. So although we're independent, there are some guidance that, you know, and some um, targeted uh, themes that have to be dealt with exactly the same way through every fire authority and Grenfell and Cladding is one of those. Um, Allowing us to work independently allows us to have a better regulation uh, approach because each area is very different. Um, in Cheshire, people think it's very leafy. You know, we haven't got um, a lot of the, the big businesses, whereas, uh, you know, so we probably don't have as many problems um, as other areas as London. That's, that's how people tend to think. However, what we have got in Cheshire is an awful lot of motorways. So um, although, that doesn't impede on business safety. The way the fire service manages things, we do an awful lot relating to uh, road safety, and that's another arm of a fire service that we deliver. Um, and we do have lots of large hotels um, and, and areas that we do have to, obviously Chester being one of them, um, where we have a lot of hotels. So we would sort of predominantly have um, more visits there because of the amount of hotels that we've got. Okay. So the engagement side, we talked about the enforcement. Um, why is it that we engage in Cheshire? I think I've touched on it a bit before, but primarily we, we want to, a fire in our eyes is a failure. So if we can engage and stop that fire from happening, that's where we want to put more money in. We want to stop the fire from ever happening. Um, and so we do it through engagement. So you might recognise that man there. That's us going around doing one of our visits, explaining how a door should fit, um, how you can check that your doors are safe. And we would go through all of that with them. Um, and if they weren't fitting correctly, then again, we would signpost them to the website um, and, and sort of advise them, actually, if you had an audit tomorrow, this would get picked up. So it's those type of things that, we, that we'll be talking through during one of our visits. This helps us to break down the barriers um, because Although we, I sort of joked at the beginning that we're very much like Ofsted, we don't want to be seen as Ofsted. We want to be seen as people to contact. So, you know, I'm very much around all over the, the, the website. There are contact details. We want you to contact us. We want to have those conversations with you. You know, we want to signpost you. We can't do it for you, but we can certainly put you in the right direction for you to do that yourself. As I've said, it builds the relationships so that you're not frightened to contact us. And there's an awful lot of free information. Um, I get all the time that people are paying uh, consultants um, and the small businesses, the paying consultants, which, um, you know, yes, is one way of doing it. However, you need to be confident yourself as the business owner. We want you to be confident that what they're selling you fits with your business. And there's a lot of free information and aids around fire safety on our website. A lot of people now have a read around those. And when you get, you know, uh, your risk assessment in, don't be frightened to challenge it. Say, well, actually, does that fit my business? Because that talks around about 50 employees. Well, I've only got 10. So it, it does this fit my business. And, and we want you to be confident to sort of challenge that because you're paying for a service and it needs to fit your business. So it's very much around looking at what, um, and you being confident um, with what other people are telling you. Okay. 
Um, it provides us with an opportunity to work in partnership um, with other businesses, uh, like yourself being one, uh, local authority being another. So we work with local authority and we do joint visits. Uh, we do joint seminars. It might be that we work with uh, building inspectors. Uh, we, we're currently got a project on in Cheshire around sprinklers. So we are working with partners around the importance of sprinklers in, in large businesses. And, it, and we will do all that legwork. So the, the business safety team will sort of do all of that, gathering the information, getting the contacts. So actually then, um, when we've pulled everybody together, we, we can get everybody in the same room together. So, you know, I, I will work at pulling that together um, so that I get the key people and the key people that can make decisions. And that's something that will come under business safety. Uh, obviously, yeah, uh, again, it provides the opportunity to raise awareness around the, the, the fire safety order. OK, so these are just some pictures really around what we do. You can see on the presentation that we have a pack. Um, that we take out um, and in that pack are leaflets. There's a copy of the pre-audit um, letter that tells you what is going to be asked for. And again, there's, there's sort of links in there to where you can find information. When you the visit normally takes probably 15, 20 minutes. Uh, that really does depend on the person that we're going to see. Um, you know, we're not, um, we're not going to stop you doing what you're doing. So, you know, if we were at a hairdresser's and she's got a shop full of people, you know, we're not going to say sorry. You know, you can't cut any hair at the moment. We're going to carry out this visit. We might pop back or say when will be more convenient. So it isn't a planned visit. It is very informal um, because we are engaging. Um, so, you know, we don't we don't want businesses thinking, oh, They've arrived. That's it now. What they're going to find? That is not the approach at all. We are very much around talking them through and letting them ask direct questions while we're actually there, making the most of us being in their business. So, um, oh, this this brings back memories. Impact days. This is what we did pre-COVID. Uh, we could actually talk to people. We could actually get close to people. Um, and what we did, we all joined forces with other what we call blue light services. So you'll see here we've got PCSOs, uh, we've got local authority and, and we sort of set up in towns um, and areas and we have all of the blue light services together um, in Cheshire. And then we advertise it. We all join together. We advertise that we're having an impact day. So um, I think this one was in Runcorn. And, you know, people then come out to see us and ask questions. So um, these, we have six impact days uh, a year, two for each of our area offices. So we have offices or sort of areas uh, we call Ch Cheshire West. We have Cheshire East and then we have Halton and Warrington. And those are the three main sort of uh, office areas that we cover. And we have two of those in each area. Uh, so six main ones. And we actually get round when we all work together and the department all come together. We actually go out and probably visit around five, six hundred businesses in a day, which is an absolute massive achievement when you think that we're in one area and we get to see all those those businesses. These might be businesses such as your new business parks that have set up and um, your self-employed businesses that have set up that um, a might have no fire safety in place at all and um, surprisingly although it's been around since 2005 I come across people all the time that are not aware that it is the business's responsibility to have fire safety they wait for the fire service to arrive and as I touched on earlier they think they've got away with it it's only when they come, we have these impact days and we do the visit and we'll say, well, have you got a risk assessment in place? Um, you know, can you go through your training for fire? And they look at us a bit blank and they're like, oh, um, didn't think I had to have all of that. There's only five of us or there's only eight of us um, and they don't have any of it in place. So at this point, um, we sort of guide them around, well, yes, you do need to have things in place. And, you know, depending on what your business is like, you need to go away and put some things in place. So if we get around five or 600 businesses in one day, that's a really good impact on a selected area. And we might have a common theme um, that we have. So again, we always do them around Christmas because businesses tend to have 
extra stock um, and the everything goes out the uh, out the window because Christmas is here uh, they get the decorations up they forget about fire safety it's a really jolly season which you know we don't want to take that away from them but we don't want them to have a fire either so we do have some themes uh, throughout the year as well Okay, so these, uh, as you can see, they're quite well attended, the seminars that we have. We do demonstrations um, and we also obviously have presenters that come in and talk on key topics. Um, the one, the last ones that we held, which was uh, pre-COVID, pre we did a session on village halls and community halls or, or uh, community spaces. Um, we've, the t there's tended to be uh, a theme, obviously, with how um, businesses are that village halls struggle for money and income they're normally run by volunteers so you haven't got anybody generally that's well clued up on fire safety and to be fair they're all volunteering their time to keep that village hall running the problems we've come across is when it gets hired out for things more than a party so sleepovers for instance where the total change and makeup of that village hall is not what it was originally built for so a village hall typically has been made for a group to come in for a half an hour an hour session scouts perhaps um or it might be what uh, uh, the wi so it the the probably what's been put in place fire safety wise meets their needs. However, when you change it to cooking in village halls, so we, we've had scouts that have slept over in village halls and, you know, we've learned after the event that they've had colour gas heaters in there, they've had tents in there, they've been doing all sorts and they have been sleeping. That totally changes the makeup of that village hall because they probably or won't have the fire detection that is needed for sleeping. So we did an event around whose responsibility it was when you hire, A, when you hire the hall and who you're hiring it from. Um, and we did um, a session in the afternoon, which we had over a hundred that attended. Um, and we did an evening session, which we've not done before, between seven and nine o'clock. And would you believe we had just short of 70 that turned up to an evening session? Um, and we've had lots more that want us to put more seminars on. We're just waiting for the for the uh, green light for us to be able to do these seminars again. But they are really well um, attended. Um, and we try and get some workshops. So we get people um, doing workshops. So, for instance, around seating with the one for um, halls around how how many should be in a line and, and we get them to put them and uh, work out how many chairs are safe to be in a line. Things that you would think would be common knowledge, but actually I've never thought about when I go and see, uh, when I go to school and you see a row of chairs, I wouldn't have known how many maximum they should have in a row, what should they be tied together, should they be loose? And we go through all of those information with them to help them keep themselves obviously uh, under the legislation but also people attending what they should know and um, so we try and vary up these set uh, seminars with uh, common themes really okay so one of the are uh, one of our main um events that we did we ran actually four of these and again we, we'd love to do this one again without us having our sprinkler campaign was a sprinkler demonstration so um I got two containers, as you can see there, one, well, they're both set up typically um, as a person's uh, living area. Um, both have all the same um, furniture in them. One had a sprinkler in and one didn't have a sprinkler in. And what we did with this was to give people the uh, the fear, really, the fear of how hot fire is, how quick it happens. And, you know, the it was almost a shock factor. Um, I saw this done over at Derbyshire and I came away and it really did frighten me how hot that fire was, how quick the fire ignited. And I wanted to bring that back to the community of, of Cheshire so that A, businesses and schools and care homes almost experienced the fire, but safely. Um, because I think that was the best way for them to go back and put their fire safety in order. And we got some really, really good feedback um, around that. Um, so 
as you can see, these are just some pictures here of um, the fire that actually took place. You can see the big difference of the one that is sprinkled and obviously how the other one uh, came to be ignited. Uh, but it was set up exactly the same. Okay, this one here, this this took 11 minutes to get to this state. Uh, and when people were obviously stood there, that, that was really, really hot. Um, and people were quite quite surprised that in 11 minutes just the sheer damage you can just see to the right there that the other one that's got a sprinkler in there's barely any damage at all um, and and it was a really effective way we had quite a lot of businesses contact us about sprinklers after this and also you know the bigger schools around what they can do because it isn't just around fire and the destruction it's what you've lost uh, the business continuity side of it as well because obviously as you can see there's not a lot left in that container at 11 minutes whereas the other one yeah is going to need to be swept out of water but everything was recoverable um following this fire in that other container and there is just a, a difference um, between obviously a fire that's taken hold uh, in 11 minutes and a fire that has obviously had a sprinkler in it that just needs a bit of water brushed out and, and dried out. Um, and we use these pictures when we're going out on our visits to show, you know, have, have you thought about what you would do in the event of a fire? Because we very much push business continuity um, because people don't always think or business owners don't always think around what would we do following a fire so um under our sort of uh under our heading we we push business continuity and we actually run our own training sessions again on business continuity setting up a plan testing the plan and 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 how often you should get that uh, piece of paper out that's got a bit of dust on because while it's dusty it's no use at all um it's almost too late. So we always say to people, pull it out, have a look. How many times have your, you know, the people that are listed on there, your staff that are listed on there, are the people that were on there two years ago and no longer work for the company? Have you taken on people that have additional needs? You may have uh, somebody that's disabled that's now working for you. Have you thought about it? So we do go through all of that as part of our visit. Uh, along business continuity and we've got free templates on our website that you can use to actually create your own business business continuity plan um, and, it, and it almost lists all the things that you can itemize dedicated to your business so we use that a lot as, as a free template. So um, the role of the team as I've said is, is, is to obviously um, deliver fire safety so I'm not going to read all of that out to you. That's basically what we have just been discussing. Um, it's around engagement and making sure businesses are safe for their employees and also customers. Now, what we find is paperwork out of date. Uh, so they've, they've started off, they've done it all, but paperwork is out of date. They've never pulled it out. It's a bit like I've just said, it's a bit dusty. We've not been asked for it. We've not had a visit. Uh, I know where it is somewhere. Um, I'll need to just go and have a look for it. Um, and they'll find that it's out of date. We, we've not had, we've had fire extinguishers in, but they should have been tested six months ago, 12 months ago. So it's a bit of the housekeeping. So we'll go through around housekeeping, how to diarise when things need to be tested. Extinguishes in the wrong place, or as I've said, not maintained or lack of knowledge around the use of them. Lots of um, extinguishers, people have them, but they've never had them maintained. So actually when you come to use them, are they gonna work? Are they not gonna work? Um, have they, you know, do, do you know how to use them? Have you had any training on how to use them? So we would go through all of that with them as well. And again, lots of information around that on the website. Um, as I said, frightening as it is, we do see an, still an awful lot of businesses with no fire protection in them at all. And um, they think they're not big enough. They're not going to get a visit. And we'll just take the risk that if we get a fire, we'll have to deal with it. They don't realise that they're actually breaking the law and obviously there are consequences of that um, so we do see an awful lot with no with, with you know normal fitted doors they're not fire doors um, or if they are fire doors they don't fit very well um, I touched on sleeping accommodation above business premises um, again we do find this an awful lot whereby you know you'll get um, 
I want to use a hairdresser for an example, um, whereby you know it's it's somebody buys a house and they turn the bottom area to a business and they actually live above it. Um, totally different legislation is required if you're sleeping above the business. You can't just put your normal domestic uh, detectors in and um, we, we find this all the time. We come across these type of small businesses more than inspectors because we're going out um, obviously informally, we're doing a walk around and we come across them. Um, and they're the ones in those situations, that's when we will pass over straight away for an inspection because we could not leave knowing that they were sleeping above that business. Um, and if there was a fire that evening, more than likely, you know, somebody would either suffer uh, severe injuries or worse. So in that instance, that's when we would make a phone call back to the inspectors and say, we've come across a business, it's got sleeping, it really does need an inspection. So that's when we would act on it almost immediately. Um, and then we've got sort of escape routes. We find all the time that, um, I'll say all the time, quite regularly mats, furniture, bikes in, in, in the escape routes. So if you've got a fire and you need to get people out, having a bike in the back uh, escape route is not great for that to fall over and everybody to fall over it. So people just don't think, oh, well, I haven't got anywhere else to put my bike. You know, I'll come in the back entrance and we, we put it here and it's never been a problem before. This is, these are the excuses that we get. So we go through, well, actually, if this needed to be an escape room, you know, what's going to happen in a panic? Uh, you've got to get the bike out first before people can get out. So we will go through all of that with them. So um, the most common causes of all fires is electrical, uh, electrical supply um, and industrial equipment which is obviously probably more in the area that uh, and the businesses that uh, you're involved with, they are our main problem. Um, when I say industrial equipment, it's normally um, bad practice um, whereby that, you know, that, that again, they've not been maintained properly or there's lack of training um, or basically the staff don't know how to, to keep them fire, fire safe. Um, so we will we will walk around businesses and we'll have a look for those type of things. And again, we'll offer guidance um, and we'll sort of spot things that, you know, if covers aren't on place and that type of thing. So we we do it in a nice informal way and we can't enforce a walk around the business. But what we say to people is if we if we can help you today, that might save you from having a fire and we can talk through some options. Electrical supply, we talk, you know, we go through the normal, uh, whether you've had it maintained, the five year check, appliances, and again, house housekeeping, um, you know, how old are your adapters, how old are your leads, and have you actually got a housekeeping process in place? Um, because those are the main cause of our fires. Well, looking at it, it's, it's over half, half of all the fires, commercial fires are down to electrical or industrial equipment. So the top categories, um, there it's sort of just uh, breaking it down to uh, where they are. So just looking at along the top, those are the three categories. So retail, food and drink, and then industrial manufacturing, which you more than likely, you know, that they are the key areas um, that, that we find. But I think what's more alarming, sorry, is that 84% um, of those were accidental. They could have been stopped. So I think um, with regards, our little chats with people, hopefully they take them on board. 84% is quite a high percentage of all commercial fires being an accident. Um, so if we can lessen those accidents by going out and chatting to people, that's the move that we want to be in. So I wanted to also talk to you about the communication channels. Um, We've had to change as a fire service. I've been um, uh, bobble laugh at this, but I've been trying to bring them into the 21st century um, because they're a bit a bit old fashioned to say the least, as in they communicate by letter, uh, email if you're lucky, um, and they didn't do a lot of what, what I call social media um, and, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, links to information. So through my attending um, business chambers, I got a little bit jealous of all these businesses that were have these really nice um, videos that they created through Facebook and they were sharing information. 
and I was there a bit like a dinosaur uh you know what was it that you do from a social media side and I'm like well, we have got a Facebook account but we don't really put a lot on there um well do you share when you've been to a fire do you you know what is it that you do so going back probably um three years ago um I challenged myself to get ourselves out there to do a lot more through social media because it is the way everybody communicates love it or hate it um everybody now uh, tends to follow Twitter or Facebook or the businesses are on there and they do go on there for information so I said we're going to have a lot more communication channels and these are just some of the channels that I now use for business safety to try and get my messages out um, because I want everybody to know about the business safety team, what we do and how you can contact us and these are some of the areas that I now use. Um, I do one radio, um, I have little short, short sharp um, 15 minute slots talk about key subject areas so I have been on the on the radio um you know we I do attend as I say the business chambers and networking events um and we go into schools and colleges as well so we, we definitely are getting out there and letting people know where we are so these are the uh, the business chambers that we're a member of and they're really good to us to be honest because we're seen as a big help to businesses that are setting off starting off um, they pass on uh, information to us and we'll, I'll go out and meet some businesses and we'll also take questions and things. So being part of the business chambers has really been a positive, um, a positive step really for us. Again, this is where we're very different. I speak to colleagues in other areas and they'll say, you're part of the business chambers, what do you get out of that? Um, how, how, how do they help, help you? You're a, a legal entity. Why would being part of them help? So I talk to them about how many thousands, some of them have got two, three, four thousand members. So if I can do one presentation, um, on a key subject area, I'm getting a lot of views. I'm getting a lot of people following me on social media and we're also getting people to connect with us which is what we want they know that the information can be found so for me the business chambers has been great when we have events we do joint events with them you know i'll invite and i'll say i'm doing an event on this can you tell that so if it was um care homes have you got care homes connected can we get a message out to them to say we've got a, a seminar and this is what we're going to talk about so they are a really good way of engaging with lots of businesses at one time so obviously i get that question what are business chambers? What, why do you bother? <laughs> why, why do you, why do you pay? And you have to pay to be part of these chambers. Yes, we do. But I do see, see real value out of being part of them. We go in there. They normally give us a free slot in their, in their newsletters. They have monthly uh, magazines. They tend to give us a free slot because we're a public service. So they'll give us a free slot or a really good price if we're, we're, we're promoting something. We get to obviously deliver our messages to a lot of people um, I get to meet an awful lot of people in a different variety of industries um, so I can sort of take questions people come to me at the end of the meeting I mean back again pre-covid used to be lovely go and meet a lot of people and do some nice networking obviously the last 18 months like you all we've been doing them via this method so uh, it will be nice to see people in person again but at least we've had this we haven't stopped we have carried on doing them via this way which um, I think again brought Cheshire to the forefront they had no choice we've got to <laughs> we've still got to engage so um, you know we've, we've still been out there and engaging and people have learned what we're doing and what our trends are. Um, okay so I'm going to touch back on this social media uh, and fire safety because this is just um, some facts really around you know since 2012 instagram has been part of facebook um it's it's instant the youngsters love instagram um i say a bit of a dinosaur myself but i'm trying i'm trying to bring myself into using all these social media uh, networks because it does get the key key information out um so a look in time where they were and where they are now it's massive everybody knows about social media and, and all of these different areas we do really well on linkedin 
because I think it's obviously business related. We get some really good messages out there. So anybody that's not following us on social media, do it now. Do it at the end of this training because we give out an awful lot of information via social media. We give links to free events. We give links to free information, uploads. So if you can, give us a follow once you've finished tonight. Um, it also raises our profile because you get to see the people, the people that are going to come and audit or come and do a visit. You get to meet the people that are in the protection team, the inspectors. I've made them, uh, well, I say I've made them, I've encouraged them to put the pictures on Facebook, to record videos, to show who they are and what we do. So it's not a stranger coming to your door. You actually know when you've seen them, you've met them on the website before, you've heard them chatting to you. So I wanted to bridge that gap so that when we turn up, it's not the dreaded, the here. It's, oh yeah, I've seen you before, or we spoke before, and that, that's all about what I wanted to do. Okay, so um, how have we gone on during the pandemic? Well, it's been, I'll be honest with you, it's been, it's been hard because obviously we engage, we've not been able to go out, we've had to do it all, we've been working from home. So um, for about the first month, I had a very big headache trying to think how we're going to deliver um but we have and we've been we've actually been really successful we've delivered last year 20 uh, to 21 we delivered 25 targeted campaigns um and those campaigns came from the results of the previous year's commercial fires what the themes were what the common uh, facts were and then we've delivered campaigns we've had them they're all on our website and they're all sort of labelled up for each month what's coming and we'll release little snippets of information which will say it's um uh, let's say it's a uh, sleeping above premises campaign next month and we'll do little drops of information and then people can use uh go on the the campaign and we'll, we'll put lots of social media posts out so the campaigns have been have been really successful and we're continuing those on we carried out desktop questionnaires. So obviously we couldn't go and visit. However, that didn't stop us. We still rang businesses up. We still sort of talked through what they had in place. Um, if they hadn't got things in place, we then got them to go onto the website. We showed them where they could find that information. Um, and, you know, we, we also sort of showed them where, what templates to complete for their business. So we really did sort of talk them through sort of handheld them really on how to put things in place so we did that and as I say we, we recorded them as, as what we call desktop questionnaires so we did as much as we could over the phone without physically seeing somebody um, we carried out visits um, as and when we could obviously last year the, the restrictions got lifted slightly so it was great we thought we're back out we're going back out again and as soon as we just got comfy slippers on we were called back in again. So we did a little bit of visits and then we went back to the questionnaires again. And it has really been a mix of just moving between like the rest of us, as and when we can, we have, and when we can't, we've gone back to um, obviously desktop audits and sort of um, social media campaigns. Okay. That was really, really, very well done, Tracy. Um, with a couple of minutes left to go before questions. Um, yeah. Just thinking, I'm not sure what, 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 what's to come, but you, you had some uh, audio you were testing earlier. Is there a video that... I will. Um, and thank you for reminding me, because I am passionate about the subject and I do carry on. So great, you've come in and stopped me. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. So if I... Um, if I go... So these are the videos that I talked about that I would like to try and show you. So I'm just going to um, stop share at the moment and I'm just going to take you to the website. like a well-oiled machine or just a machine with lots of oil on it it's all good is it right well <laughs> let, let's see if i can get this up I'm, I'm not promising but i'll try so let's see if i can share screen again okay can you see that at all yep okay <laughs> So basically, this is our website, and I just wanted to show you on our website where all the free information was. So if you click on this business safety uh, box there, that is where all the information is. 
there's lots of key topics here and lots of information down the side. But um, this here is where I took the staff to the next level. I made them record some videos. I made, I encouraged, uh, <laughs> got their hands behind the backs and said, come on, let's do something. So here, um, if it just loads, you will see that we've done videos on lots of key subject areas. And these are Q and A's that we get asked all the time. So you can go through um, and sort of listen to some of the questions that we get asked and the, the, the response that meet fire safety legislation. So um, it's probably going to take a while to, to load, but um, just get one, I should, if it'll just load quickly. Um, Fantastic idea, really well done. That's that's really, really good use of technology, isn't it? It's brilliant. It is. So the just, um, I'll, I'll click on that one and see whether it loads up for us. But basically this video is all around business continuity plans and the questions that we get asked. If it opens. Probably isn't. There you go. It might just be a bandwidth, maybe. Who knows? Okay. Okay. Um, but, but we know where to find them, so that's fantastic. You know where to find them. So so basically, um, yeah, Q&A, any Q&As. Um, do apologise if I've rambled on too much, but I hope Not that's given all. you an insight to what we do in Cheshire. Um, yeah. As I say, we are a little bit different to others. But I'm really proud that we have a business safety team and really proud of what we've achieved during COVID because we have totally changed how we deliver um, and it's been received really well. No, absolutely, Tracy. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. So I've picked up on the continuity and pulling, pulling little plans out, giving it a dust stop and testing things. Um, the industrial bad practice and 84% of accidental uh, commercial fires are avoidable. That's, that's a hell of a statistic there. Um, I know Jen's got some questions lined up in the background for us. So over to Jen. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. That was uh, that was really good. Um, we've got some really good questions from the box and some I think Ash has pulled together. Um, one of the ones is, what do you see as the impact of the new Fire Safety Act 2021 on the Fire and Rescue Service? So I think, um, obviously, again, the sort of strategically, it's going to make, um, obviously, the it's around keeping people safe, you know, which has always been what the responsibility should have been. But there were some grey areas. And this is um, when it changed to the responsibility for the business. Then in 2005, it was because business wanted to control, um, obviously, how they manage fire safety. The fire service weren't that happy about it because it almost moved the uh, moved it over. This is going to be somewhere between the fire the fire authority and businesses having to come together to make sure that there is this joined up working. Because, as as seen with Grenfell, you know the the shared and joined up working wasn't always in place because the responsibility was left with the business. Um, we can go and do an audit, it's a bit like an MOT, it can pass today and tomorrow it can be totally different. So yes, it's passed an audit, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna be okay tomorrow or next week. And I think this is where this new piece um, of legislation is gonna try and tie up and have a close relationship between business and fire. Yeah, great. Um, what is the success or failure rate of your informal approach and how many businesses after having a visit and information from you go on to have a full compliance inspection from an officer? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. Um, and obviously over the last year, it's been very different. But we do every week, every week, I would say we pick up at least three to four businesses that we go to that we can't leave in, this, in the way that they are. Um, so we will pass them on for an audit. Um, so they, they will be that they've got chemicals or their practice is really bad or sleeping um, or basically, you know, they have no understanding of their responsibilities. When we start asking some questions, they literally have no idea of what they should have in place. So I would say generally three to four times a week, we pass on to one of the area officers that they need an inspection. Okay, good to know. Um, I know Claire's still on the call, so I'll just um, 
pick up on this one for us. She's got a query on sleeping accommodation above business premises. She works for a housing provider and some of their domestic accommodation is above a business. Um, so within their lease, they don't have any scope to inspect or insist on certain standards. So in effect, they can do whatever they like. Have you got any advice on that? Can I ask, is it in the Cheshire area? Uh, so Claire, are you nodding? No, it's not. <laughs> right. What we'd say is I would contact, contact your local fire authority of, of where it is because there can be joint visits um, whereby that, that can be looked at because definitely it, it does fit under the fire safety order. Any, any sleeping above a business, there is a responsibility. The responsibility could be with the landlord. It could be the responsibility of the business. It really depends what's in their tenancy agreement and how it's written. So what would say is if you're not getting any joy, I would contact your fire service and they will go out and they'll do a visit and find out who is responsible for what. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, um, okay, how would a member of staff whistleblow if they feel the fire safety precautions are inadequate in their workplace? Ring us up. <laughs> Email us, ring us, get in contact because we don't have to tell the people. We, you know, we, when we go, we just say we've received a complaint. We don't say whether it's an employee, whether it's a staff member. Um, we've just received a complaint and we've come to have a look. Or, you know to, to see for ourselves so you know contact the fire service if you have concerns and you've you've not if you've tr you know try the normal methods but if you feel you're not getting anywhere then yeah contact the fire service and you know if it's all contact me and I will uh, certainly pass the details on but no it's it's all you are not named when we go out and do that visit okay great um do you promote extinguisher training over an online awareness course we, Cheshire, um, don't deliver training. Um, what we do is we've got, um, again, information on the website of areas that you can do and, and also sort of how you can look at it yourself and what should be in place. The reason we don't do training where other fire authorities do, our view is because we are quite proactive in taking businesses and uh, to court. And if we deliver training, what we don't want in court is that they say, well, we went on their training course and, uh, well, we've done everything that they said and they will use it as a way to not meet legislation. So because we've, we're, we're quite proactive in prosecuting, we signpost and make it their responsibility. So we don't actually deliver the training ourselves. However, we can, we do have a list or we signpost you to BASFA, which is obviously an independent uh, whereby you can go and get a list of people in the local area that can carry out that training. Brilliant, thank you. Ash, have we got time for one more question or are we? Yeah, so we, if everyone's happy to stop on, we can do one more. Okay. Um, within the businesses that you visit, is arson a significant risk or threat? Um, I wouldn't say it was a threat, but it is a common theme. Um, and again, during the visit, we, we do have a look around. We, we talk about good practice, um, you know, the checks that you should be doing at night time. And again, if there's rubbish or bins near to the business, where to better place them. Um, it is a common theme. It is there and it does happen. And we did have uh, within Cheshire, there has been a rise during COVID. Again, uh, I think you know, people looking for things to do. We did have a slight rise in, in arson for businesses um, over COVID. So yeah, that's certainly been one of our messages. But there is quite a lot of information again on uh, that we, we do a checklist. So basically you can go through um, uh, when you're first doing it, a checklist of what to check for and to obviously make it harder for uh, somebody just looking for trouble. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Jen. Uh, Tracy, just uh, an, a massive thank you so much. We've had 84 people on the web talk tonight, so thank you very much. There's another 84 informed uh, safety professionals out there with a, a bit more of a clue to fire than we had an hour ago, so thank you so much. And uh, to Bob for, for helping facilitate this. He's done a great job, Bob, as in the background. He's managed to sleep his shoulder, all of that, as you know, <laughs> Jen and myself, so well done, Bob. Good skills. Um, and you wouldn't believe it, that was Jen's first question and answer session. She did really well there as well. So, hold on, Jen. <laughs>